Hello, my name is Adam Delora. I'm a third year medical student at the University of New Mexico, and today I'm going to be talking to you about vomiting in the pediatric population. So we'll start with our patient vignette. Eleven month old boy uh, coming in for six hours of intermittent crying episodes. He hasn't been eating much. Uh, he's been vomiting his juice and milk. Um, the vomit's now turned green. He has no relevant past medical history. He's up to date on vaccines. His temperature is 100, um, 40 breaths per minute, 150 uh, beat per minute pulse. He's been drawing his legs up to his chest, and he's been crying for 15 minutes and having his intermittent episodes where he stops crying for uh, 20 minutes and then starts crying again for 15 minutes. He, and he has a sausage bike mass, mass in the right side of his abdomen. So what do we think this is going to be? Uh, intussusception. And what are we going to do for it? We're probably going to do an x-ray to look at things like perforation and obstruction. Um, and then if we still think it's that, we're going to do an ultrasound. And if we see like a target sign or something, we're going to do an air enema. Um, so if the air enema fails or there's some kind of peritoni uh, peritonitis or perforation where we'll probably end up doing some kind of surgery. Um, so your first step is to try the air enema, and if that doesn't work, then um, you can go to surgery. You can also do contrast en enemas as well. 90% um, of kids have no identifiable lead point. Lead points, so interception is essentially telescoping of one portion of the bowel into another portion of the bowel. Um, it tends to happen at the ileocecal junction, but other things that can cause it are like a Meckel's diverticulum or uh, hypertrophied pear patches or different things like that that would cause a piece of the bowel to telescope into another piece. Um, but in 90% of adults, there's some kind of mass that's the identifiable lead point. Um, but in kids, you tend to not know what that uh, lead point is. Um, there have been some vaccines, like rotavirus vaccines in the past, um, ha that have higher rates of uh, thought to cause those kids into susception, um, mostly by hypertrophy of the pears patches. So yeah, that's into susception. Um, the intermittent crying episodes would make us think that um, the bowel is telescoping and then untelescoping, um, or it could get stuck like that for long periods of time and you'll end up having uh, ischemia, and the patient will end up having these so-called current jelly stools. And essentially, it's this red bloody stool. Um, it's caused by ischemia of the bowel. So at that point, it's uh, pretty bad. Um, so yeah, let's talk about our differential diagnosis. Your, a kid comes in with vomiting. We'll talk about some infant and more um, child causes. So the first thing that you should be thinking of is, is this viral gastroenteritis? That's going to cover most of your patients that come in with vomiting. You're going to see like fever. Sometimes you're going to see diarrhea. Um, in terms of workup for this, it's mostly going to be a clinical evaluation. Occasionally, you may want to do an immunoassay like rotavirus or adenovirus, and thinking about sick contacts is important. You would do the immunoassay if you think that, okay, we've got a bunch of kids in here, and Maybe they're spreading something around or something like that. Um, another cause of vomiting would be GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. It's going to be like, if you see it in an infant, it's going to be like fussiness after feedings. They're going to be regurgitating. Um, and then uh, poor weight gain, they're going to be arching their back. When they're on their back, it's gonna, they're going to have that reflux and it tends to cause back arching. Um, they'll have cough, strider, wheezing. Um, and that's from aspirating. You can do a trial acid suppression, so you can give them something that will suppress the acid. Or uh, in more severe cases, you might want to do, a, to do a GI study, or if you're worried about some other cause of like um, uh, upper esophageal obstruction, that would be another reason to do that. Um, bacterial uh, enteritis or colitis. You're going to see diarrhea. A lot of times it'll be actually bloody diarrhea as well, especially if it's like a, a Shigella or some kind of a, a E. coli that causes bloody diarrhea. Uh, 
they'll end up with fever, uh, usually crampy abdominal pain. They'll have sick contacts or they'll have eaten something. Um, rarely, you'll do a stool exam and you'll check, you'll do a culture of the stool and check for WBCs, but that's really not common. Um, pyloric stenosis, um, that's going to be usually between 2 and 12 weeks, but even more specific, 3 and 6 weeks. Um, they'll have projectile vomiting after feeding. It's going to be a non-bilious vomiting because it's going to be of the uh, pylorus. Uh, that's kind of narrowing. So it's not going to get far enough to get to any bile in the duodenum. Um, so replace the fluids is the first thing that you're going to do with these patients. And um, then you're going to do a pylorotomy, so you'll take them to surgery, but replace fluids first because they might have like hypokalemia, hyperkaluremia, um, some elevated uh, bicarbonate. Um, the, the patient that you're going to see, they'll have projectile vomiting after the feeding, they'll have infrequent stools uh, because they're not eating as much and they're vomiting up everything they're eating. They'll be, they may be emaciated or dehydrated. A lot of patients will bring them in before this. Um, they'll have a palpable olive in the right upper quadrant, and that's essentially just the pylorus. That may or may not happen, especially if they're really distended and um, holding a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff in their stomach. It's kind of hard to palpate. So uh, other things that you'll be looking for is kind of like a hungry baby. They'll be really hungry because they've just been vomiting. It tends to happen more in males at a ratio of 4 to 1. Um, you, you may also see peristaltic waves, visible peristaltic waves going across the stomach. Um, on ultrasound, you'll see either what's called a donut sign, which is essentially that thick pylorus, um, if you get a cross-section of it, or depending on how you do the ultrasound, you might also just see the elongated pylorus, and there's um, there's criteria that the radiologist will use to determine whether it meets criteria for elongation. Uh, other things that you may see, congenital atresia, meaning just a piece is blocked off. Um, it could be like a duodenal atresia, it could be an intestinal atresia, like a jejunal atresia. Uh, duodenal atresia is going to be more associated with things like Down syndrome, Another thing that you would see in Down syndrome would be an annular pancreas, where the pancreas, when it's forming congenitally, goes the wrong way and it kind of squeezes the duodenum. Those are associated with Down syndrome. Um, jejunal or intestinal atresia is going to be more associated with like smoking and cocaine use, and it's more like an avascular type of thing. Other congenital atresias, they might have like esophageal atresia. And in that case, what you could do is you can try, they won't even be able to take very much food to begin with, um, just because it'll be going down and hitting um, the esophagus and just coming back up. What you can do is you can do an x-ray and you can stick an NG tube down there and you'll see the NG tube curling. Uh, so if it's far enough down, you'll see some abdominal distension and you're gonna notice this right away when the baby comes out. Uh, they may have polyhydramnios, they may have Down syndrome or jaundice. You're going to be doing an abdominal x-ray for this or an upper GI series, depending on what you're thinking. Uh, the polyhydramnios is because in utero, they're not going to be able to swallow the fluid. Um, so that'll cause a polyhydramnios. Another thing uh, we talked about earlier is susception. They're going to have the colicky abdominal pain that kind of comes and goes like we had our patient, inconsolable crying, uh, less lethargy, um, they're going to be drawing their legs up to their chest. The current jelly stools is kind of a later thing um, when you have the ischemia. It's going to occur most likely in 3 to 36 months. You'll do an abdominal ultrasound, uh, and you'll have air or contrast enema. Unless there's some kind of perforation, this is both diagnostic and uh, treatment. And... Uh, yeah, it tends to happen at the ileocecal junction, uh, just because that's a good place for it to telescope into. So the terminal ileum goes and it uh, telescopes into the cecum. Hirschsprung's disease is another thing that you would see, see vomiting in. You would see it in neonates with delayed passage of meconium. 
abdominal distension, bilious emesis, and you would do an abdominal x-ray or a con and contrast enema. Essentially, it's failure of migration of the neurons. So when the neurons are migrating, uh, it tends to go It tends to go proximal to distal, so when they don't go all the way distal, uh, the neuronal migration doesn't go all the way distal. It'll essentially cause an inability of the colon to contract, and then you'll have buildup of stool uh, kind of proximal to that point. And so. The way that you would check for this is you would see an abdominal x-ray and then at the point where the neurons have migrated to, you'll see kind of a distension and then past that you'll see the obstruction with uh, less uh, bowel in there, bowel blocking and uh, the passage of stool. So you can do a contrast enema for this as well. If you do a digital rectal exam, you'll see explosive stool coming out. Um, the patient will fail to pass the meconium. And you can do a rectal biopsy. I've seen rectal suction biopsies as well as just normal rectal biopsies. And you look at the slide, the pathologist will look at the slide and they'll look for um, essentially lack of neurons, uh, which is kind of annoying for them to look for the lack of something. But yeah, they'll look through a bunch of slides. And um, if they don't have those neurons there, then that's, that's, what's, uh, that's what's going on because you need the neurons to um, cause the stool to, the peristaltic waves to happen. Um, and then the treatment for that surgery, you're gonna take out all of the affected bowel. So you'll take a little piece and then see if that's far enough. If, essentially your rectal suction biopsies will tell you when's far enough to go. Um, yeah, so, and also your um, abdominal x-ray will also tell you when's far enough gives you some information when you're doing surgery. Uh, malrotation, you're going to see bilious emesis, uh, abdominal distension, pain, bloody stool is a potential thing that you may see. Um, so you're going to do an abdominal x-ray. You may do contrast enema or upper GI series. When you're looking at the upper GI series, it's important to think about the anatomy of where the stomach is and where the contrast should go. So if somebody gives you a picture of an x-ray or a picture of the upper GI series, it's kind of a fluoroscopy and you're going to see where the contrast is going, it's important to look at where the stomach is and where it passes into the duodenum. You're going to look at all the segments of the duodenum and you're going to look at where the duodenal jejunal junction is and the ligament of trites and make sure that that is in the correct place and kind of keep following it down. And if there's no issues, if you don't see it kind of, after it goes to the ligament of trites, you're gonna see it kind of descending backwards towards the spine. Um, yeah, so just follow that down and think about where it should be. And if it's not where it should be, then that's potential malrotation. Uh, so that's the way that you would look for that on your X-ray or upper GI series. Um, you would do nasogastric tube decompression and essentially surgery because you have to fix the malrotation of the uh, of the bowel. And essentially the reason why that happens is uh, it could be like a valvulus or some kind of twisting of the bowel. Um, and a lot of times it's essentially when the fetus is forming, the... Uh, the bowel is going to be rotating. It's, it kind of protrudes out and then comes back in. If that process doesn't happen correctly, you're going to have your malrotation. So. Sepsis is another thing that can cause vomiting. You're going to have fever, lethargy, uh, tachycardia, tachypnea. The kid's just going to look terrible. Uh, increased pulse pressure, hypotension. Uh, you can do uh, cell culture. You would also do a chest x-ray if you think it's something respiratory. You might also look at CSF if you think it's meningitis. You can also measure lactate to see uh, perfusion of the organs if you're looking for something like shock. Um, 
Another thing that can cause an opening, food intolerance. You might have abdominal pain, diarrhea, eczema, urticaria. Um, sometimes the, uh, yeah, a lot of times you'll see diarrhea in these patients. And you're going to be eliminating foods to determine what the food is that they can't handle. You can also do skin tests and uh, radioabsorbent uh, allergy tests. Uh, metabolic things that you would think about is a lot of times the newborn screens will catch this for you. Like uh, if they're doing like their PTAU and they'll do things about uh, galactosemias and stuff like that. Um, a lot of times newborn screens will get that for you. but the patient will present with poor feeding, failure to thrive, uh, lethargy, hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, maybe some unusual odor, especially if it's like PKU, they'll have like a musty odor, so, and maybe cataracts if they have like a fructosemia or lactosemia. Uh, important to think about all these things, it'll depend on the disorder that they have, but look out for all of these and then match them to the syndrome. Uh, you're also, when you're done, Working up these patients, you're going to take electrolytes, uh, ammonia, LFTs. Uh, you might also do some glucose, uh, bilirubin. The uh, UN creatinine is important. Uh, CBCs, PTs, PTTs, looking at their uh, liver function and bleeding stuff. So, yeah, it's important to work up all these uh, potential metabolic syndromes with the patient if it's just what's going on. Uh, appendicitis. You'll see malaise, uh, and it tends to be a periumbilical pain that migrates to the right lower quadrant. Uh, these tend to be more adolescents and uh, some children, uh, as opposed to in newborns and infants and that sort of thing. Vomiting after pain, so they'll have the pain first, and then they'll be vomiting after that. Not usually tends to not be the other way around. They'll have uh, anorexia. They'll have McBurney's point tenderness, and they'll also have a um, rasping sign. So it's important to palpate on both sides of their lower abdomen. Uh, so you'll palpate over here, and you'll also palpate uh, a third of the way from the anterior uh, superior iliac spine. Uh, the patient may also have decreased bowel sounds. And uh, you'll do an ultrasound, and the reason you'll do an ultrasound versus like a CT or something like that because you're going to want to decrease radiation exposure in the patient. Uh, so surgery, or depending on if they have it for a super long time, like six days, you may just do antibiotics. Uh, and then they may want to do an interval appendectomy, or if it ruptures, they might want to do an interval appendectomy as well. So essentially what that means is that you'll put the patient on antibiotics, and you'll take them in later, and then you'll remove the uh, appendix to make sure that the uh, inflammation doesn't occur, occur again in a, more, in a safer setting, essentially, when the patient's not uh, at a lot of risk. So serious infections can also cause vomiting. If they have like pyelonephritis or meningitis or sepsis, depending on what they have, like pyelonephritis, they'll have like dysuria and they'll have like, some back pain and stuff like that. Meningitis, they'll have like photophobia and um, headaches, and you can do uh, neck flexion to see if that's causing uh, issues. Cyclic vomiting syndrome is another thing that you would see in children. Uh, it's greater than three episodes of uh, this nausea that's kind of with this unremitting vomiting, and uh, they also have abdominal pain. They tend to have headaches. It's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. You need to make sure that you check everything else before you can say, cyclic vomiting syndrome, uh, tends to use in females. Uh, eating disorders are another thing that you'll see. Look for lesions on the knuckles if they're uh, causing themselves to vomit. Uh, changes in hair, uh, skin, that sort of stuff is important to look out for. Pregnancy, uh, look for sexually active teens. Uh, you're gonna wanna do your uh, beta HCG do their pregnancy tests, see if they're pregnant. Uh, something to look out for. Foreign bodies is something that you'll see kids swallowing stuff that they get a hold of. Uh, only 10% of these patients will need intervention. The rest of them, they'll just like pass it within 24 hours, whatever they swallow it. 
important things, button batteries. So if you were to do like an x-ray of them, the, these button batteries actually have coating on them. So as you can see, um, and what I was reading about the button batteries is that they can, you can touch two sides of the terminal and it'll actually, uh, it'll actually cause some type of electrocution and that sort of stuff. Um, there's also acid within a lot of these batteries. Uh, so there's several reasons that you want to do take these out. If you can, you could do bronchoscopy or something like that. Or a uh, rigid um, esophageal and just kind of grab it, take it out. Um, sharp objects are another thing that you're going to want to take out and multiple magnets that can kind of, as they're passing through, like attach themselves and cause perforations and stuff. Go get those. Um, because you don't want any kinds of perforations. That's the, that's the thing that you're watching out for, is that these foreign objects can really cause perforation. Um, some toxic ingestions to look out for. Over-the-counter drugs, insecticides and pesticides are important. They, you might end up with uh, the patient that comes in with like a cholinergic syndrome, the salivation, lacrimation, diarrhea, vomiting, sweating. Intestinal cramps, seizures. Um, if it looks like a cholinergic syndrome, look for nicotine and insecticides. Those are important. They also might have taken medications that cause cholinergic syndrome. But nicotine and insecticides are important. Um, antihistamines and tricyclic antidepressants can cause an anticholinergic syndrome. So look out for that. Also, if you're x-raying patients, some things are radio-opaque. Um, Play-Doh is radio-opaque, so the kids name Play-Doh. Iron tablets um, is another thing that'll come up. Uh, Enteric-coated aspirin will come up as well, and lithium and mercury will also come up as well, so they're dorcopenephrine, lomicrine, regular, um, or took uh, bipolar mothers, lithium pills. Um, Increased intracranial pressure is something that you'll see in people. Um, epidural hematomas, anything like that, if they have some recent history of head trauma, be thinking about um, vomiting from that. Um, any type of meningitis infection, if you're thinking tumor, that's another thing that can cause increasing intracranial pressure. Anything neuro that can cause inter increased intracranial pressure. Pseudotumor, cerebri would be another thing that you'd be thinking about. Vestibular things, if it's like Meniere's disease or some kind of labyrinthitis, um, uh, that could be another thing, it causes dizziness and nausea and then vomit. And then migraine headaches. Migraine headaches can also cause the nausea and vomiting as well. So that was just a big differential diagnosis and something to look for when you're trying to diagnose causes of vomiting and some treatments. So uh, thanks.